so as it was said in the presentation, my name is Sara Olsvi. Uh, I'm the leader of the party Inuit Adaratigid. Uh, we are uh, the next biggest party in Greenland at the moment. Uh, we hold 11 seats of the 31 member parliament in Atisartut. Uh, we are a red-green party. I think that's the correct way to say in, the, in, the, in Canada. Um, in Europe, we would call ourselves uh, socialists, and that's also what we do in Greenland. Um, we have general assemblies every three years, and at, at our latest general assembly, our no to uranium policy was um, again uh, unanimously um, voted for. So we have a very clear no to uranium policy in Inuit Adratigid. I would say that we are the only party in Greenland that has uh, such a clear policy. Uh, the ultimate, ultimate goal of Inuit Adratigid is for Greenland to have uh, economic and political self, uh, self uh, independence from Denmark and self-determination, full self-determination. Um, we were formed, our party was formed in 1978, uh, and as I will tell later, uh, as I think not, um, that, that the, the, the Greenland is quite uh, um, unknown in Canada, I'll say a little bit about uh, uh, the history of uh, political history of Greenland. Uh, we had home rule in 79, and actually at that time, our party voted no, because we would have had, uh, we would have wanted to have even more uh, self-determination than the home rule gave us. So we are a political party that is, uh, has all the years been struggling for Greenland's independence and uh, our people's self-determination. Um, as I said, uh, we are the current uh, leading uh, party. We have been the leading, uh, sorry, the leading opposition party. We have been the leading party for only four years uh, in the history of Greenland's parliament. And that was in the years 2009 to 2013. Uh, at the general election in 2013, uh, the, the party that ha had, uh, prior to 2009, held um, power for 30 years, came back into power. Unfortunately, uh, they are not, uh, pr uh, they are pro-uranium. Um, and uh, we also had an uh, extraordinary election, I don't know if you call that that, but we actually uh, had a very, very big, um, scandal going on last year, so we had an election only a little bit more than one year after the election in 2013. And unfortunately, we did not get majority uh, from Inuit Adratigid or the opposition, but I was quite happy to, to, that we actually now have the sa same number of mandates as the leading governing party, uh, so they also have 11 mandates. They went from 14 to 11. Um, oh, sorry. I was moving it on my iPad and not on that one. <laughs> uh, and as you can see on this picture, this is uh, the 11 members and our staff uh, in two th the fall of 2013. And that day we were all wearing these black shirts with a yellow uh, sun on them. And that was the day where the majority of the Inatisartut, um, we had the first reading of the, 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 the government's uh, proposal to repeal what we had, uh, what was called the zero tolerance on uranium. So, Gadaslinunat, uh, Greenland. Um, you probably all know that it's the biggest island island on Earth. Um, we are not that many people. We have more than two million square kilometers for 56,000 inhabitants. Uh, we all live on the coast because uh, the middle of our, of, our, of our island is covered with ice. You can't see it on that picture, but this picture shows uh, the four municipalities we have now and then uh, the, the national park in the northeast part of Greenland. Uh, the majority of us are Inuit. Uh, something like 85 percent. We do not have a, uh, like uh, other indigenous peoples, uh, have a, a way of sort of counting who is Inuit and not, uh, but we generally say that about 85 percent of us are Inuit. As I said, we had home rule since 1979. That's when we had our own parliament. And in 2009, we had a new agreement with Denmark, which, uh, uh, with, with whom we are in a realm, together with the Faroe Islands, um, called the Self-Government Agreement, a law that was passed in the Danish parliament, as well as the Greenland parliament, which gave us a uh, possibility to take over responsibility of a long range of legal um, 
legislative areas, including the subsurface resources. So at this point today, since uh, 1st of January 2010, uh, it's the Parliament of Greenland and the government of Greenland that has all responsibility of all kinds of minerals. Uh, and also we have the um, ownership of the minerals uh, as opposed to before 2009, where we didn't, we ha we, uh, Denmark was still uh, in charge of all that. So uh, my uh, headline for today's debate is that with self-government or self-determination comes responsibility. Uh, we have taken over a huge responsibility when we took over uh, the subsurface resource legislative area. And as I will argue in this presentation, we have not succeeded in uh, living up to that responsibility. And I would say, even though I'm the leader of Inuit Adaratigit, I would say that we, w we didn't uh, succeed in that during our time in government either. So uh, we don't have any uranium mines yet. But this picture of Greenland shows uh, the sites that have been registered as, as being uranium sites um, in the report published by the Greenland government and the Danish government up uh, just prior to the repeal of the zero tolerance. We know uh, from Inuit Adratigit that there are other sites as well that are not marked on this uh, map. Uh, in Avanosua, Tule area, uh, very north uh, of of Greenland, I don't know if this one points. Oh yeah, up here, uh, where there's also a US military air base, we know that there's also uranium in the ground. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to give another presentation in plenary where, we'll, where I will talk a little bit more about the process of the zero tolerance repeal. But I just wanna say now here that that um, the government at that time in 2013, the fall of 2013, decided to 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 to, re to, to do the new uh, uranium policy by a simple vote in parliament. And prior to that, there was no public hearings or the public uh, or any involvement of the public directly in the decision-making process. I'll talk more about that on on Thursday, but. As you can imagine, being in opposition, uh, it was uh, uh, horrendous. It was not very nice to be part of, of, of the parliament um, when that decision was taken. We, of course, voted no together with a few other mandates, and the count, vote count was 15 for and 14 against. Uh, this is another picture that shows some of the um, uh, uranium uh, sites or places where there is uranium, uh, but only a few of them have actually been explored um, thoroughly. And one of them is uh, here, Gwennosuit in South Greenland. And that is also the one project that is being uh, debated in the public. There's no, no other projects that are being debated in the public. And that is because that particular project is quite uh, advanced and the corporation, as you can imagine, um, year after year say that the day after tomorrow we will apply or something like that. Uh, that's a bit uh, exaggerated, but they keep saying that they're going to apply in a few months um, for actually actual uh, a mining license. Uh, they, they are doing exploration and there has been uh, exploration done for, for, for many years since the 1960s. And um, as you can imagine, the public of Greenland is very, very split on this issue. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of information uh, in Greenland. I was very happy when Helen, uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott came to Greenland uh, and, and we had a, a small conference on, on the issue. That has been the only conference ever held in Greenland where we have had other people than people from the government or the corporations talk about the issue of uranium. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, our people is so split on this issue is that our economy is under uh, great pressure. And that's also what, what came with self-governance. Because with the self-government agreement with Denmark, we actually decided ourselves that the block grant 
uh, and I voted yes. I was very much pro self-government. I'm still. We need to take more responsibility. We need to, to build our own economy. But one thing that has made it really hard in these years is that previously, prior to 2009, we could uh, every third year renegotiate the block grant uh, that we get from Denmark, uh, which at this moment is actually making up something like 50% of our economy. Um, as a, uh, as, and, and now, after the self-government agreement has been uh, inaugurated, um, we cannot renegotiate the block grant agreement. So it's a fixed amount we get every year. Uh, it means that, uh, of course, our uh, country is a country with a high level of welfare. And we are, just like in many other societies, seeing that we are having fewer younger people that uh, uh, can be employed, while we have a lot of elders, and we will in the coming years have more and more elders that we, uh, who can work, of course, want to support. Um, so the block grant being frozen, our economy and uh, our income and uh, our um, the, the money we need to use to actually make Greenland uh, function is, is starting to be a, a huge gap. And some, um, the, the Economic Council of Greenland is saying that we will be lacking something like 800 million Danish kroner um, a year, every year up until 2040. Uh, yeah, I'll say something about that. Uh, so. The situation is still that, that the, 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 the economy is under great pressure and uh, the money that we make ourselves from resources in Greenland is from fish and shrimp. And uh, of our export, 90% is from fish and shrimp. That is our most important uh, industry and it will continue to be our most important industry. Uh, the, the picture over there is, uh, I don't know the English word, uh, satire, uh, satire, <laughs> yeah, satire, uh, from one of the Danish newspapers. Uh, when the zero tolerance was repealed, the woman in the middle is the previous premier uh, who was in, le in the lead, uh, leading, or the premier uh, of the government that decided to repeal the zero tolerance. Uh, and as you can see, she's... Um, holding on to the polar bear, which is the, the animal that is the symbol of our government, and also to the Santa Claus, uh, who has this um, nuclear uh, face and, and who is holding a big uh, bag of money. And I thought this satire uh, drawing was quite good because it shows in a picture the, the sort of the feeling we have um, in Greenland that, that the government uh, the, the previous that, that was in government uh, 2013 to last year, and also the government that took over when this lady was um, pushed aside. Um, what they're thinking about is money. And it is, a, it is, and they have to do that, but it is as if they think that uranium is going to be like Santa Claus who comes and gives us uh, whatever we ask for. That is not the case in our opinion from Inuit Adaratigit. It's a seal. <laughs> we have a lot of seals in Greenland, and we also export the, the seal uh, skin, uh, but we don't really make any money on that because the Europeans don't want to buy the seal skin. They think the seal is a cute animal. <laughs> the EU has a seal product ban, which we have been fighting for years, and we are still fighting that. They have an exemption for Inuit hunted seals, but our argument is that it's a resource, there's enough of them, we are hunting them sustainably, of course we can export the seal skin. Um, these pictures are uh, from um, different situations. We have, had, um, we have seen several demonstrations against uranium mining. Um, the biggest picture on the left side here is from the opening of the parliament in the fall of 2013 when the repeal of the zero tolerance was on the agenda. Uh, and every time there's a fall session in parliament opening, we have this very traditional and um, I don't know what what you call it, but it's like everybody are very nicely dressed up in our national suits, and we have to walk all the 31 members uh, from uh, through town, from church to the parliament building, 
sort of uh, stating that now the parliament is going to be in session. This demonstration was the first demonstration during that walk. And I would say that it was a historic demonstration. There was another demonstration in 2014 where the lady you saw in the blue dress before uh, was, uh, was um, pushed off as a government leader. Uh, that demonstration was much bigger than this one, but this one was actually the first one because the, that walk from the church to the parliament building is something that is very respected. It's the 31 members of parliament. We have to walk uh, in a certain row with those who have been members the longest in front and those who have been members the, sh the shortest time in the back. Uh, and there's sort of a lot of um, atmosphere around that happening. So. They, of course, demonstrated silently. They didn't say anything. And they had, as you can see, tape across the mouth. And it was very, very, very um, effectful to walk in that line. Um, the year after, when things were going really bad, uh, both the zero tolerance had been repealed without the public being heard. We saw that, and it was revealed that there had been um, abuse of public funds from the government. Um, the demonstration was much, much bigger, and it was very, very loud. And that, of course, was also a very strange experience. Um, but actually, emotionally, I was mo more moved by that demonstration there, um, because uh, being completely silent it also showed that the public was actually si silenced by the government. Um, and um, strangely enough, I would like to say first, um, make clear that these demonstrations against uranium were not organized by our party. There are different groups that are against uranium, and these demonstrations were organized by uh, NAMIC, Boyan Nakbunga organization, that's, uh, it means no thanks uh, to uranium. But that other demonstration in the left, uh, right bottom picture there was organized by the leading uh, gov governing parties branch of NUC, which they called a pro-uranium um, demonstration. And I included that picture to, sh to show, of course, that there's people that are pro-uranium, but also because I wanted to show you that uranium issue in Greenland, the uranium issue, unfortunately, has become a party political issue. And unfortunately, we are seeing in Greenland that uh, the support of our parties is like when people support soccer teams. They don't think it goes through the heart to the brain, but it has to go through the brain to the heart, in my opinion. So um, we were not uh, accepting, if you, if you can say that, uh, that other demonstration, because it was a political demonstration. It was not the people's demonstration, whereas the other ones um, against uranium were actually the people's demonstrations. Um, I'm not going to say much more uh, now, because I would like to also have questions from you. Uh, and also, I'm going to speak again on Thursday. Uh, but I have a very important message uh, that I want to bring to you. And that is that we need more information. We really need you guys. I was uh, in the n room next door when you were talking. And uh, Hilo, for example, we really need people to come to Greenland and tell us about their stories, tell us about their experiences. Uh, unfortunately, the whole uranium issue in Greenland um, is talked about as, as if it is only a local issue, and it's not what we are saying from Inuit Adaratigit all the time. It is a global issue, but it's very, very difficult. It was said in the beginning that um, Canada was bilingual. I know that it's multilingual. Greenland is bilingual. Uh, we have Greenlandic and Danish as our, our, our languages. But there's not a lot of information about uranium in either Greenlandic or Danish. So we, we are lacking funds also to inform our people in our own language. And that is a very big problem. Uh, so we need to get together and find a way to get all of the information that is, is presented here 
to the local communities, to Greenland, for example, and also find a way to make all of that information understandable in our own languages. Uh, that picture there is Gwen uh, um, uh, the the area in South Greenland, and I'll talk more about that on Thursday, but uh, the whole area is, is the only sort of well-developed farming area in Greenland. Um, a lot of people imagine, and I'm from North Greenland, so that's also my picture of my home country, that we are uh, all um, about ice and snow, but we actually have uh, farming in Greenland as well, and sheep herding. I'll uh, participate in the Sheep Herders General Assembly this summer, uh, and it will be their 100th uh, anniversary. I was there last year too. Last year they decided to have a uranium policy, or something that resembles a uranium policy, but it's because it is an indirect uranium policy that they could agree on. They opposed to tailings. It's quite difficult to do uranium mining without uh, producing tailings. And also, they decided that if there's going to be uranium mining in their area, uh, it's not only going to be the sheep farmers that are closest to the mountain or the mine that will have to be um, compensated. They all want to be compensated because it's going to hurt their livelihood, uh, not just the ones that have sheep and farming next to the mountain. Unfortunately, that message was not given uh, very clearly to the rest of Greenland up until recently, just two months ago. Um, and one can speculate why that is, but the pro-uranium uh, people and certain parties have a lot of power also in, in public uh, civil society organizations, unfortunately. So um, Greenland is part of a global world. Uh, somebody was, uh, oh, Helen was talking about US and Canada, uh, oh no, sorry, US and Russia recently, or to this morning. And Greenland is actually in the middle of, of uh, the Arctic, uh, in between US and Russia. And we also feel the things that Helen was talking about recently. The Russian ambassador, ambassador to Denmark uh, had some very, very unacceptable remarks about uh, how Russia could attack um, Danish uh, Navy vessels, which are also Greenlandic Navy vessels, because we share uh, the same Navy. Um, if uh, Denmark was, was going to take part in the NATO missile defense system. Uh, but Greenland already has US, a US military air base. And that is actually being debated very much in these months uh, because we saw in the fall that a new agreement about the airbase, uh, uh, about servicing the airbase air was, was made uh, where they chose to use a, a US company instead of a Greenland company, uh, which means that we will lose a lot of tax income from that base. So we have a renewed debate in Greenland about uh, the US military presence in Greenland. And our party have been taking the lead in, in pushing the agenda uh, towards us renegotiating the agreement with the US so that Greenland actually gets more tangible um, outcome of having a US military base on our land. But we are part of a global world. We are the ones who see and feel the global uh, warming. Uh, from Kasigengwit, uh, where I am um, from, uh, just here in the Easter time, I was actually on the ice fishing. I haven't done that since I was a child because the ice has not been good enough to go fishing on. Uh, so we had a cold winter this year, but we do feel the global warming very, very uh, clearly in, in Greenland. We live from the living resources. As you sa saw, 90% of our export, we also hunt whale and seal, and everything is under pressure. Uh, the European and, and the American imperialism in this world is something that we feel very much. We have to really fight to actually be allowed to hunt what we have hunted for thousands of years and actually also live from that resource. So in the end, sometimes we want to ask ourselves, what do you want us to live from? Because everything is under pressure, if it's a living resource or if it's not a not non-living resource. But it is not with any cost that we want to do mining. And uh, from Inuit Adaratigit, we're saying it's not going to save our economy to do mining. We know that it's other ways, other roads that we have to do. Go. We also feel, as I said, the power relations in the Arctic. Uh, Greenland is not a big player, but we are part of the game. 
and that also poses a um, challenge for us to actually know about uh, superpower relations, to be able to talk with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the US and Russia and Canada and uh, Iceland and, and Norway and all the other Nordic countries. And we are building all of that knowledge because we need to be part of what is uh, going on and we need to sit uh, at the table and take part in the decision makings also on an international level. So self-government comes with responsibility. It's not easy, uh, but uh, because of that responsibility, you don't have to lose your morals and principles. And that is what we are saying from Inuit at Aratigit. Um, everything, of course, comes with a price, but there's also a limit. So we will keep fighting against uranium mining. We know that there's a lot of other possibilities in Greenland and other sites where you can mine other things without uranium. Um, uh, but, but in conclusion, uh, I would just like to say that I'm very happy to be here and listening to your experiences. And please help us in Greenland inform our people because it has uh, turned out to be much more difficult than, than we maybe thought uh, and we need help to inform our public. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Yunga. Come on, it's time to tell Yunga. No, 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 Thank you. Speaking in my language as well. My name is Hilu Taguna. Can you hear me? Tuhanna Chap. Clear? I'm speaking today representing, um, speaking, presenting on behalf of a small but effective non-governmental organization called Nunavumiu Makitagun Nangningit, which translates to the people of Nunavut can rise up. Right in there? Okay, is that better? <laughs> which we call Makita for short. Um, I'm from Baker Lake Nunavut. Um, it's considered the geographic center of Canada. We are caribou Inuit. As Sarah was speaking earlier to the fact that many Inuit live on the coast, we in Baker Lake live on a large lake and our subsistence is on caribou and we don't have sea mammals and such to survive on. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers of the World Uranium Symposium and the invitation for me to speak here today. It's an important gathering. I'm really pleased that I'm speaking with Sarah, who has a lot of the same concerns as we do in Nunavut. And their work we've always followed, so and it inspires us in Nunavut as well. Nunavut is a territory. There's Baker Lake. Nunavut is a territory in the Canadian Arctic. It's the size of Western Europe but it has a population of only 32,000 people. Like Greenland, 85% of the population in Nunavut are Inuit, living in 25 small, isolated communities. There aren't any roads connecting between communities. It's all fly-in. And during the summertime, we get sea left to bring in dry goods and whatnot. What, r the rest of the year, everything is flown into our communities. It's a special honor for me to be speaking today. As my mother, Joan Scotty, has played a central role in the opposition to Nunavut, um, uranium mining in Nunavut since the late 80s. She continues to be active and she spoke at the World Uranium Hearing in 1992 in Salzburg, Austria. And this was just after Inuit managed to stop a uh, proposal by a German company, Uringeschelschaft, to develop a uranium mine at Kigavik, an ore body just 80 kilometers west of Baker Lake. She spoke at the World Uranium Hearing in 1992 and helped to understand that the pop opposition to uranium mining in our community, you have to understand how close we are to the land. In her words, most people only moved into the settlement of Baker Lake in the 1960s. Before that, we lived on the land in small groups. We still go out on the land every chance we get. When the people from the uranium company 
come to speak to us in Baker Lake, they don't understand that while our bodies may be in the settlement, our hearts and mind are on the land hunting caribou. As I prepared for this symposium, I reflected on what has changed and what has remained the same since my mother spoke in Salzburg in 1992. Among the things that have ch changed are that the Nunavut territory was created in 1999. Settlement of the Nunavut Land Claims Agreement resulted in the creation of a new territorial government. Inuit representative organizations and other institutions, such as the Nunavut Impact Review Board, which is responsible for impact assessment. Another change, oh, that's my mom. I forgot to change the overheads too, sorry. <laughs> Another change is that the small German company that wanted to open a uranium mine at Kigavik has been followed by the French nuclear giant Arriva which has submitted a proposal to exploit the same ore body. One thing that has remained the same is that the Inuit of Baker Lake continue to oppose a project that we feel poses a huge threat to the caribou on which our well-being and our culture depend. This map showing the range of the Be Beverly and Kamanriyok caribou herds and their calving grounds, as well as mineral leases in the blue, mineral claims in the red, prospecting permits in yellow, and the protected areas in light green in the area. The blue spot is surrounded by the blue spot surrounded by red just west of Baker Lake is where Arriva hopes to build its uranium mine. I think it's important to state that um, it's close to the Thelon River, which is a watershed into our lake. Um, all the lakes that surround the project um, feed into the river. Numerous uranium companies have mineral claims and prospecting permits on caribou calving grounds. Makita opposes the Kigavik proposal for the same reasons that the people all around the world oppose uranium mines. From all the radioactive tailings that the mines leave behind to the unacceptable end uses of uranium mining. But we in Baker Lake have two specific reasons for opposing the opening of the Kigavik proposal. The first is the basin opening nature of the Kigavik proposal and the very real possibility of induced development. As you can imagine, once the one project is approved, it will be more uh, affordable for all the other projects nearby to use, to use the uh, infrastructure in place to open their minds. Instead of building a standalone mine, they could build a road from other ore bodies to the Kigavik site and utilize the infrastructure in place there. As we know from the experience of the First Nations to the south of us, the development of road systems poses a grave danger to the well-being of caribou populations. As you can see from this slide, if Gigavik is approved and actually gets built Inuit face, the prospect of the entire region being open to uranium development, induced development after Gigavik mine is open, significant cumulative impacts without protection in place for the caribou and post calving grounds. Caribou calving grounds and the post calving grounds. The current planning and policy framework is insufficient to protect critical wildlife habitat and important cultural areas from the induced development that would re result from the approval of the Kigavik proposal. The Kigavik proposal and its base and opening potential therefore poses a serious threat to the long-term viability of Kivalik's, Kivalik region's caribou herds and potentially their harvesting by Inuit in Baker Lake and other Kivalik communities. The Kivalik is a region that is central. If you can imagine, Nunavut has three regions, east, central, and west. We're in the central Arctic, and there are seven communities, and we have a number of herds that go around our lake. Um, 
and of course throughout the, ter the territory and region. Our second specific reason for opus op opposing sorry, the Kigavik proposal is that Arriva has not announced when they would begin construction and operation of the mine. When Arriva submitted the project proposal for review to the Nunavut Impact Review Board, the world price for uranium was high enough to make the project economically viable. The price has since fallen well below the point of economic viability for this project, but as the review process had already commenced, Arriva was faced with the option of either withdrawing its proposal altogether or altering its proposal so that it, was, it no longer specified when the project would commence. Makita and other partners argued that among other things, it's impossible to accurately model environmental or socioeconomic impacts without knowing the time frame in which the impacts were, would occur. We just had the final hearings the first two weeks of March and we await the results. It's um, similar to a judiciary process and NERB will then forward their recommendation to the federal minister for him to make his decision. And so at the beginning of the final hearings of the Nunavut Impact Re Review Board's review, the Baker Lake Hunters and Trappers Organization submitted a motion to the board that the review process be suspended until such a time that the proponent provides reasonably developed project proposal that includes a project start date with realistic timelines. The Hunters and Trappers Organization stated their position very clearly. If Arriva is allowed to proceed without a timeline, it will make a mockery of the assessment process in which it fought so hard to create through our land claim agreement. Unfortunately, the Nunavut Impact Review Board decided to hold the final hearing and we now await their decision. It may not come to pass, but it seems entirely possible that the Nunavut Impact Review Board will approve the Kigavik proposal. If so, it is also entirely possible that the proposal and the review process will end up in court. I would like to offer a few thoughts about where democ democracy fits into this process. When our NGO Makita was formed in 2009, and the first thing that we did was publicly call on the government of Nunavut to call a public inquiry into all aspects of the possibility of uranium mining. The government refused our request and instead developed a uranium policy which lists a number of principles. Just five principles. One principle is that uranium mined in Nunavut must be used only for peaceful and environmental responsible purposes. Everyone attending this symposium will know that there's no way that our government can control how uranium is used once it leaves our jurisdiction. Another principle stated in the policy is that uranium exploration and mining must have the support of Nunavut Mute, with particular emphasis on the communities close to the proposal. It was extremely disappointing to us that having stated this in their uranium policy, our government made no effort to gauge how the people of Nunavut feel about the proposed gigavik uranium mine, and especially those of us that are living in the communities most likely to be impacted by the project. At the hearings, just a few weeks ago, a senior official went so far as to state that the uranium policy is not like a checklist and that the principles clearly stated in it are not items to be checked off. After that statement, it's not clear to us what the meaning of the government's uranium policy has. The result of the community input into the final hearings of the review process was overwhelmingly opposed to the Kigavik proposal. But this has not impacted on the position of our government and it remains to be seen wh whether this will have an impact on the Nunavut Impact Review Board's decision. Simply put, Decision-making around proposed uranium mining in Nunavut raises fundamental questions about the democratic, sorry, democratic process and political accountability. 
I don't have time to explore many other aspects of the debate over uranium mining in Nunavut, so I would refer those of you interested in details to explore our website. In particular, I would draw your attention to the submission that Makita made to a UN study on extractive industries in, in indigenous territories. It doesn't cover the final hearings of the review process because that just happened just in the last month, but it provides a great deal of background and analysis on previous chapters in this ongoing story that may be of interest to you. There may be more chapters yet to be written. In closing, I'd like to thank all the experts, many of whom are attending this symposium, who have traveled to Baker Lake to share their knowledge with us over the years. And who have assisted Makita and other organizations in our work. Like it is in Greenland, if it were not for the help of people like you and our small non-governmental organization, there would not be a voice that was telling Inuit anything else other than what the industry is saying and what our governments are telling us. Gordon Edwards and many others have made an enormous contribution to our efforts to prevent nuclear industry from gaining access to our territory and while we are very grateful for their support. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.